Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, hey guys, last episode. I had uh, started the intro, actually, and, uh, but, I mean, I wouldn't gotten coffee, and why, why edit out, you know, 15 seconds if I can just do the intro again? My name is Connor. I'm from Rhode Island, New England, USA, in that order. I like to learn about history through YouTube videos, recommendations, original link to the video, top of the description below, why am I out of breath after just running up and down the stairs? Original description, description, original link to the video down in the description, right below that link to the discord, click on it, send it right over there, I'd love to have you. And under that link to my second channel, Mr. McJimmon, where I do more non-history related content. I've been going to the gym, all right? It's not, I mean, I haven't been doing cardio. I, I just was lifting weights, so maybe I should. Let's go. Got my coffee. I can hear. Go. Rio de Janeiro, 1919. This year, Carnival is different. The flu that had killed 15,000 in Rio is gone, but its spirit lingers. Float crews adopt macabre themes taken from the height of the outbreak. There's the block of the Holy House, playing off a popular euphemism for the hospital. Behind them parades the block of the Midnight Tea, named after a I rumor that doctors that. killed terminal flu patients with opium overdoses. Streetcars pass, decorated with teapots and cemetery gates. A few months before, the same streetcars had collected the city's dead. The third wave of the pandemic kept killing until 1920, but it was clear that the worst was over. Humans had done little to stop the virus. Instead, it simply ran out of fuel. Those who caught it became immune, and it spread across the globe so fast, infecting so many people, that herd immunity began to protect those who escaped previous waves. Ran but there so the virus just ran out of food. There were still flare-ups. On November 11th, 1918, the news broke. An armistice. The Great War was over. People flooded the streets, ignoring bans on public gatherings. And in each city, a new wave of infections followed the impromptu celebrations. In Greenland? The same would happen again and again on a smaller scale, as loved ones gathered to welcome returning soldiers home. There were still outbreaks, still deaths. But everyone could see it was trailing off. The horror was past. All that remained was to count the cost a project that continues to this day. In the years after the pandemic, researchers initially estimated the disease had killed 20 million people. Modern estimates have increased that number to 50 million, though because statistics aren't available in the worst hit regions, like India and Russia, the final number may be twice as many. How many people has COVID killed? It's gotta be at least like a few million, right? My guess, five million, six million died maybe. Uh, COVID world deaths. Uh, what's the total? 5.18 million. That's crazy. And so if there were 100 million deaths with population of Earth, uh, uh, 1920. No, not, no. Uh, one, so almost say call it two billion. So less than a third of what we have today. Um. So you'd have to multiply the hundred million by three to get what that would mean today, which would mean like three hundred million possibly. Hey, hands out to all those virologists and. Uh, you know, doctors and whatnot who helped curb this thing. Although it doesn't seem like it is nearly as dangerous as the flu back then was, or they just were much uh, less knowledgeable and knew less how to uh, call it. So, According to modern estimates, it killed 17 to 20 million in India, perhaps 4 million in Indonesia, possibly a million in Russia, 400,000 in France, and 390,000 in Japan. In the United Kingdom, it sickened a quarter of the population and killed up to 220,000. In the U.S., it took around 675,000, more than the Civil War, 
and killed 16,000 in Philadelphia alone. But for a disease that killed so many, it's hard to point out direct consequences. In fact, the flu seems to have worked in tandem with the war, each magnifying the effects of the other. In the 1920s, a wave of political unrest swept countries around the globe. This was because of the war, but also because the flu had revealed deep inequalities, especially in colonial rule. Post-viral fatigue from flu infections probably contributed to the depression and listlessness that took hold after the war. Yet, dis- by the way, guys, I'm 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 loading another video that I did right before this that might interrupt this one. Don't worry, I just I'll pause and stop it. Despite the heavy toll the flu took and the heroism of medical workers that died fighting it, there's still no monument commemorating the event other than plaques marking mass graves. Textbooks mention it, but usually just in passing. We chose not to remember, which is why some have christened it the Forgotten Plague. There are theories why society chose to forget the flu. Perhaps Wait, so they didn't dig up the mass graves and rebury them individually? Came and went so fast that people simply remembered it as part of the war. Or it's possible that focus on the war and inability to see the big picture meant that society never really absorbed what happened. But keep in mind, it also hit a generation that was just more used to epidemics in a time where mass death may have been less shocking. Conversely, some have argued that the flu was so traumatic, families formed unspoken agreements never to discuss it. The memories that did endure were intensely personal. Lost parents, lost siblings, friends gone too soon. Families impoverished when their breadwinners died. In some cases, soldiers came back from the trenches. So to did, it did it affect children bad too, or, or was it somewhat like COVID in that it's, it's pretty harmless to kids? When their breadwinners died. In some cases, soldiers came back from the trenches to find their entire family wiped out. Ask your family, and you might find a story. That's crazy. That's insane. That's such a mind F. It's like your family is going to cry over you going off to war, likely dying. And when you live and come back, your family is the one that is dead. It, it, what, what is the word for that? Like a They're in like dark irony or something? Entire family wiped. Yeah, dark irony. Doubt. Ask your family and you might find a story of your own. Generations later, the trauma still lingers. Yet apart from Catherine Ann Porter's pale horse, pale rider. Is that from the Bible verse? There was no explosion of novels about flu as there were about the war. It was a more difficult subject. It's faceless enemy more challenging to portray than the man-made terror of the trenches. But Porter wasn't the only notable person to suffer from the flu. In fact, it infected so many famous people that it raises a chilling question. How different would our world be if even one of them had died? Among the ill were President Wilson, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, Gandhi, Kaiser Wilhelm, and General Pershing. A generation of notable artists. So they were all infected? Question. How different would our world be if even one of them had died? This question, it, it, it's like when you think of this question, it's like, oh my, oh my God, like what if... Uh, like Hitler's mother had like a stroke in childbirth and died and Hitler died with them or or someone, you know, like, wow, what if George Washington was never born or what if Osama bin Laden was never born or like think about how different the world would be today. And maybe Osama bin Laden is the best, but I mean, 9-11 would have changed a lot. But it's like, uh, this makes me think like, it's not as if we've th there's been this perfect record of the people that changed the world a lot all lived a it, 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 think about the inevitability of all of the people uh, evil and righteous you know giving bad to the world or good to the world and would have changed it immensely did die and we just don't know them because they died before they did anything great you know among the ill were president wilson British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, Gandhi, Kaiser Wilhelm, and General Pershing. A generation of notable artists caught it as well, including T.S. Eliot and a young ambulance driver named Walt Disney. Franklin Roosevelt contracted it while sailing on USS Leviathan. 
Then there are the people we did lose. The president-elect mm -hmm. USS Leviathan. Oh. Then there are the people what we did- What was he did do during uh, 1920? Did lose. The president-elect of Brazil and Austrian painters Egon Schiele and Gustav Klempt. Lenin's right-hand man succumbed, clearing the way for his replacement, Joseph Stalin. And in New York, the flu killed an obscure German immigrant, allowing his son to cash in his life insurance and expand the family's real estate business. Is this Trump? His name was Frederick Trump. Called it. You might be familiar with his grandson. But the flu also drove scientific discovery. Doctors developed new surgical techniques and procedures for disease containment. It likely sped up the civilian world's adoption of ambulances. The desperate vaccines produced during the pandemic, cocktails of antibodies from every bacteria doctors sus- <laughs> I love that, and don't get me wrong, it's not like I, I can call this a dumb decision because I know nothing about biology, virology, um, cures, you know, vaccines. But I, I just found it funny how they reached a point where it's like, let's get antibodies and, and essentially like create a virus out of all of these diseases and see if any of them stick expected were the predecessor of today's combination vaccines like diphtheria tetanus pertussis nurses who bore so much of the burden won new confidence and respect for their profession increasingly their discipline became more than serving as doctors assistants and the flu helped them be seen as professionals in their own right many cities and nations caught off guard by the crisis established new health departments and organizations to monitor disease it helped push the idea of national health insurance and government-provided medicine. And it drove research. By the 1930s, researchers were crafting effective flu vaccines. And many who battled flu would go on to do great things. Anna Williams nurtured an entire generation of female researchers. FDR eulogized Welch via radio. And remember Oswald Avery, the guy Welch tasked with finding Pfeiffer's bacillus and who helped develop the pneumonia serum? After the war, he returned to researching bacteria, trying to discern how a bacteria without a hard coating Pickle? transformed into a bacteria with one. After laboring for 20 years, he finally found the substance that caused the change, DNA. That's right. Avery discovered that the purpose of DNA is to carry genetic instructions. Today, he's considered a pioneer of modern genetics. The flu also drove research into Pfeiffer's bacillus, which many still believed caused flu. After working in a military hospital during the war, one Scottish doctor devoted his life to studying microbes. One day, he accidentally left a culture of it out for the night. When he returned the next morning, he found a strange mold growing on it that killed any bacteria it touched. That man was Alexander Fleming. And the mysterious mold? Bread? It was penicillin. The first wonder drug and probably the most consequential discovery of the 20th century. Even today, the 1918 flu... The discovery of genetics is more... You, you would rank the discovery of genetics over the, disco, or over the, the creation of the, of the World Wide Web? I won't argue this should probably be number one. Discovery of the 20th century. Even today, the 1918 flu remains a subject of study for researchers. In fact, over the last several decades, researchers and epidemiologists have started to make breakthroughs on the 1918 flu, helping us better understand what happened so we can combat the next great pandemic. Researchers still don't know where the flu emerged. There are way more theories than we portrayed, but we can now name the culprit. In 1998, Researchers obtained a lung sample from a frozen grave in Alaska and confirmed what many suspected. The 1918 flu was H1N1, an avian strain, new then, but is less dangerous now that our immune systems have had a century of exposure. They've also begun to unravel the pandemic's mysteries. For instance, we now suspect that it killed young, healthy people precisely because they were young and healthy. Those patients that turned blue they probably weren't killed by the flu at all, but by their own immune systems. Once infected, victims' immune systems triggered a massive inflammatory response known as a cytokine storm. But instead of neutralizing the flu, this enormous release of disease-killing cytokines filled the lung sacs with fluid and inflamed them so much they couldn't absorb oxygen. 
But the greatest lesson of the flu pandemic is that flu can't be ignored. We don't shrug off new- Wait, so are they saying it was worse if you were young? Flu strains anymore. Because of the fact you had such a strong immune system? In fact, many health orders be ignored. We don't shrug off new flu strains anymore. In fact, many health organizations monitor both human and animal strains, predicting the dominant variety each season and creating vaccine ahead of time. If a new strain does arrive, we'll be much more prepared than doctors were in 1918. We have electron microscopes, antivirals, vaccine labs, and tested containment plans. Oh my god, this was made before COVID. But a vaccine is more prepared than doctors were in 1918. We have electron microscopes, antivirals, vaccine labs, and tested containment plans. But a vaccine don't shrug off new flu strains anymore. In fact, many health organizations monitor both human and animal strains, predicting the dominant variety each season and creating vaccine ahead of time. If a new strain does arrive, it did. we'll be much more prepared than doctors were in 1918. We have electron microscopes, antivirals, vaccine labs, and tested containment plans. But a vaccine would still take months to produce, meaning we'd start by using the same measures they did a century ago. Voluntary quarantine, banning public gatherings, staggering work hours. In fact, as Rob researched these episodes, the city where he lives, Hong Kong, closed schools to prevent a seasonal flu outbreak and killed birds that tested positive for avian influenza. A century later, the battle against the 1918 flu and its offspring continues. So seriously, get your flu shot from an actual medical professional and not a uh, animated cat. What? Awesome series, awesome channel. Great guys, uh, keep recommending stuff. See you in the next. See you next. See you later.